Hello there guys and welcome, it is Niran here and today it is time for me to bring you a second channel video, something I've not done uh, too much recently, but again I am going to try and get back into that. When I, when I get my new PC in uh, in October, at the start of October, uh, I will be doing so many more random games and live comms and GTA videos will be coming to the channel. And this is a very spur of the moment video, um, you'll have seen from the title, it's the, the, the state of Formula 1. Now this isn't the game. Uh, that, that's a totally different ball game. I might even do a video on that, the, the game F1 2015, which is perhaps the worst game I've ever played. Nevertheless, um, the state of Formula One in general as, the, as a sport, but it was just something I was thinking about, and it was actually, I think it was mainly to do subconsciously with when I was watching the Monza, which probably has already happened, the, even the race by the time I've got this video out. Um, but I was watching FP1 and FP2, it was talking about the um, the penalties that people were getting, the 25 place grid penalties for McLaren, the 20 place grid penalties for the Red Bulls, the 10 place grid penalties for the Toro Rosso, and that combined with a tweet that I saw from a guy called Smooth Racing, I'll leave his Twitter in the description below. Um, it, it, and his, his tweet said, remember when drivers got penalties for actually doing something wrong? And I, it got me thinking. And I know, you know, people talk about penalties every single race weekend. There's nothing new there. Everyone always complains when it comes to these 25 grid penal 25 place grid penalties, sorry, that seem to get dished out to McLaren every race since flipping China. But it got me thinking about the sport as a whole in general. So I've decided to do this video talking about like my thoughts and what I think is wrong with the sport. Now it, again, it goes back to this whole this whole thing about the drivers, they used to they used to have to do something wrong to get a penalty. This is my first issue. The the it's too elaborate. This this whole I know they did the rule change for the 2014 season. Yeah, they did. It was the 2014 season. I don't know why that took me so long to think about. But they did this change for the 2014 system uh, season, uh, talking about the power units. Okay, with the, the new power units and hybrid systems and and all that. A, it's too confusing. I as a as a viewer. As a Formula 1 viewer, since 2002, I don't understand half the stuff that's going on when it comes to the power units, how, what, what parts are alloc- how many, um, of each part is allocated for, for each, for each season, each race weekend, I don't know what the hell's going on about, what, what think about the casual viewer of Formula 1, who only started watching Formula 1, I don't know, last year, this year, there's plenty of them, the sport's got so much more popular since, certainly since I started watching it, Formula 1, I, I used to be in a situation where at school, I would be the only person who knew anything whatsoever about Formula 1. And this is back as, as early as, like, as soon, as recently, sorry, as like year 7 or year 8, which was only like, I don't know, 7 years ago. So in 7 years, we've gone from a situation where maybe like, 5% of the population in the UK know anything about Formula 1 to now about 20%, 25%. It's a big sport now in the UK, probably on par with stuff like, I don't know, even probably close to being on par with stuff like rugby and cricket. Yet it's so confusing. It's so incredibly confusing. I, as someone who's watched Formula 1 for so long, I know nothing. I know absolutely zero. I, I could probably learn stuff about it because I've, I've known about Formula 1 for a while. But in terms of just casually knowing everything to do with the power, you know, about the power units, how how many are how many parts are allocated per season, I know nothing about it. What each individual part does, I know absolutely nothing about any of that stuff. So that's too confusing for the casual viewer. And in all honesty, I think in some instances too confusing for the drivers. Now, a lot of the time when you get exciting racing series, it tends to be because the drivers have had some sort of input or even in general, the drivers enjoy it as well. If the drivers enjoy it, it's most likely the fans watching, the viewers, the casual viewers, are going to enjoy it as well. MotoGP, WRC, British Touring Cars are fantastic examples. All the rule changes get run by the drivers, I, as, as far as I'm aware, certainly for World Rally Championship, because I remember seeing an article about the WRC drivers being happy with the changes that are going to be implemented for 2016 slash 2017. Now, for Formula One, it's a completely different scenario, it's a completely different situation, because you have an instance where FOM management, all the people who make the decisions, run it by the teams. The teams have completely different agendas to the drivers and the viewers. Now, I'm not saying that has that's a bad thing, because at the end of the day, the teams know what's going down when it comes to the economics of the sport. 
Formula One can't be too expensive at this point in time because it's just not it's just not good. It, 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 this climate at the moment, economically, can't sustain Formula One like it was in the early that in the late sorry no hang on the early thousands. It's just not possible. It's the same as British touring cars. The spends for for British touring car teams in 1999 2000 were extortion and they had to cut it down and it's been the same in Formula One so I'm not saying that's a bad thing but if you want entertaining racing which is what a lot of people talk about there have been some entertaining races this season Hungary especially uh, Malaysia was okay uh, there was another one that was all right it was Canada was, was that okay I can't remember so a few of them Hungary mainly but that's pretty much the only, you know, really entertaining race we've had all season. And last season, the only real classic we had was in Monaco. So one good race a season is not enough to keep the casual viewer interested. A, they're already confused now by how confusing, you know, the sport is in general. And I know it's naturally confusing because there's so many different parts, so, so much that goes into making a Formula One car. But it's been overcomplicated so much since the mid thousands, late thousands, so incredibly much. Um, and now they're not interested because the racing isn't good enough either. So if you have a situation where you please the drivers, you run the changes by the drivers first, you have a more entertaining sport for the drivers and a more entertaining sport for the viewers. I know it's you'd be naive to think that's that in a you know that's in a perfect world. In a perfect world that happens. You know, because even the drivers can make a mistake. They could say, you know, something will help the racing be more, you know, more interesting, and then it turns out not to be. But th think about this. GP2 as a sport, I know is helped in entertainment value by the, the actual drivers. You know, they're fairly inexperienced, they have more incidents amongst themselves. But th in theory, those cars are, what, exactly the same as the 2011-2012 sort of spec Formula 1 cars? They have DRS, but even before DRS, last season GP2 was massively entertaining. You'd probably get about three times, maybe even four times more entertainment out of one race within a race weekend in GP2 than you would out of the Formula 1 race. You'd only watch the Formula 1 race for the prestige of it all because it's the biggest, the biggest event of that race weekend. Now how... The GP2, I know the drivers are more inexperienced, but you've got you've got guys now who are teenagers on the Formula One grid. How is Formula One so much less entertaining than its feeder series GP2? When really oh, the only difference is that the GP2 cars is a spec is the GP2 car, sorry, is a spec that's now like three or four years old. That's what they've got to think about. And I know it's not all about the spectacle, it's not all about you know how entertaining it is. They've got to think about safety as well. That's a completely different issue though, because in terms of the rules, that's, that's to do with safety, but in terms of the rules, it, that doesn't allow it to be entertaining enough as well. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of scope for when it comes to engine development, but where's the scope for aerodynamic development? You've got guys now like Adrian Newey, who themselves have lost interest in the sport. If people who have been so ingrained in the sport for decades have lost interest in Formula 1, how is the casual viewer, how are the drivers even going to keep interest in the sport? I, it's, it's like, I don't know, it's kind, of weird, it's kind of strange to talk about, weird to describe, because Formula 1 has been so good for so long. And I was actually talking to um, another YouTuber, Tom97HD, and, another dude, and, and some random dude on Twitter about the Mercedes dominance era, in quotation marks, and the Ferrari dominance era, in quotation marks. And they're two completely different entities. The Mercedes domination era is, you know, last two years. Let's let's just say last two years, right? Um, 2014, 2015. How many classic races have there actually been in that two-year period? I'd say Monaco last year. Uh, Bahrain was good last year. Uh, and Spa was okay last year, mainly because of the controversy. I'm not sure, apart from Monaco 2014, none of those are classics. So now let's move on to this year. We've got Hungary 2015. Uh, which was a very, very good race. I'd have probably rated it about 8 out of 10 in the grand scheme of Formula 1, right? But where else? I mean, you know, you've got good races here and there. Canada, Malaysia, you know, there were some good races here and there. Mainly the ones won by Vettel. But beyond that, were there actually any good races? And this is the issue. But then when you think about the Ferrari dominance era in quotation marks, this it lasted a little bit longer. It lasted about two years longer than what we've had so far with the Mercedes dominance era. But you think about that, apart from 2001, there were probably about five, four or five, sorry, classic, classic, right, races within each season. 2000, uh, was it um, Hockenheim, 
Nürburgring, Manicor, Imola. Moving on to 2001, that was probably from the only one I can remember. And this is before I really started watching Formula 1. I haven't really watched the 2001 season back. But um, Malaysia was an insane, uh, an insane race in 2001. 2002, you had Brazil. Uh, I think Imola again. Hockenheim again. Um, 2003, Brazil. 2004, Imola again. And Magni Court. There were so many good races within that four or five year period. Even per season. Not even, not even within. I know that that era lasted longer than the era we've had so far. But just each season, each individual season, you had more entertaining races. Beyond that, we obviously got the cost of the sport. It's too much. They're trying to cost. They're trying to cost. They're trying to cut costs. That's fine. That's absolutely awesome, and it's working to an extent. But still, you know, you're getting teams driven out of Formula One, left, right, and centre. Teams come and go, but usually they're taken over by another team. When you look throughout the history of Formula One. BAR, taken over by Braun, who were then taken over by Mercedes. They didn't outright leave, they got replaced instantly, they got bought. Jordan, bought by Midland, then bought by Spiker, then bought by Force India. Benetton, bought by Renault, then turned into Lotus. Jaguar, then turned into Red Bull. Um, the uh, Minardi, then turned into Toro Rosso. The only teams I could think of that had left and not been properly replaced you know, and just been bought by another by another company or by another team in the last sort of 15 years were Orange Arrows and Super Aguri. Super Aguri, who were a random team who came in in the first place. Orange Arrows were a team that had been going for a while, but Super Aguri had only been going for like two years, one and a half at max, actually thinking about it. But at this point in time, we're actually getting teams that seem to be leaving and not getting replaced. I mean, Caterham are going. I know we're getting Haas, but that's not a direct takeover. That's just another team coming in. Mana, let's face it, unless we get some sort of miracle across the next two years, they're going to leave. Uh, Force India are linked with leaving. Lotus are were linked with leaving and now appear to have been bought by Renault. So that's at least one positive there. But you're getting more teams just leaving and not getting replaced than you were before. So the, the whole teams come and go thing, I think that I heard Martin Brundle talk about, that's fine, but they're, they're going, but they're not actually coming. They're not being replaced instantly like they used to be back in the day. Even like footwork turning into orange arrows in the first place, that sort of thing it just isn't happening anymore. You're getting teams just leaving and just that's it. You know, you don't see, you know, the, the, the workers lose their jobs because they're not going straight into another team. The guys from Jaguar, loads of the people who used to work for Jaguar still work for Red Bull because they just got bought over. The factory just got bought, the workers just got employed, the cars just got used, it's just that sort of thing. And then moving on from that, the classic tracks appear to be in danger. I'm fed up of, of, of tracks like Sochi getting implemented into this calendar. They're not entertaining, they're a fantastic spectacle and I bet they pay a heck of a lot of money to Bernie Eccleston to get in. The Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Why the heck are we getting the Azerbaijan Grand Prix? It's fine. I don't mind this. The, the whole argument of oh they don't have any racing heritage. That's a little bit. That's a little bit harsh, you know, because every country has got to start somewhere when it comes to any heritage in any sport. But the fact that we're getting. I mean, have you seen the layout? I'll probably put a screenshot of the layout in the background. The layout of that track is dismal. It's like a Formula E race. But Formula E is fine because all the tracks are, for, like, are, are like that for Formula E because they're street tracks. That's absolutely fine. That doesn't detract from the action. For Formula 1, that's going to be useless. 90 degree left-handers and right-handers all over the place is going to be terrible for action. And then you've got tracks like Manicor, the old Hockenheim. I don't... Can, someone has to be able to explain why the old Hockenheim was taken off the calendar. Why Hockenheim now is being taken off the calendar. I know they're going through sort of financial issues, but Nürburgring, Hockenheim, let's face it, probably going to be lost. Magni Court got lost a while ago and was one of the best tracks on the calendar. Uh, Imola, I think, was because of a different reason, but we'll, we'll put them in anyway. Uh, Monza's under threat. Spa is under threat. To be honest with you, if Spa, Francorchamps and Monza got lost off the F1 calendar, I would potentially stop watching Formula 1 because they are by far the best two tracks on the calendar at this moment in time. Malaysia's okay as a track, as a class, as, but that, even then, that's not really a classic track, is it? That was built in like the late, the late 90s. Same for Catalonia. Are there actually any classic tracks left anymore, apart from Monaco? I don't really think there's any other tracks that were built like 50, 60 years ago. Actually, Silverstone as well. 
So Silverstone and Monaco, you've then got a situation, they're the only classic tracks you've got left on the calendar because you've now lost Spa and you've lost Monza. So the costs being cut is affecting the racing, but I suppose it's helping in the long run. Still not helping teams because Bernie Eccleston doesn't seem to care about the smaller teams. That might be very harsh to say, but if you're going to get a situation where you're going to get three car teams, which was talked about massively at the end of 20, uh, at the end of 2014, it hasn't come to fruition. I don't think it will do now. If you get a situation, I know Lotus is going to get taken over by Renault, but if you lose Force India, you lose Mana, but you gain Haas. Let's say we, uh, you know, we gain Haas. Right, we've now got nine teams on the grid. Okay, there were there were days where you used to have 15, 16 teams on the grid. Not all of them were good. Some of them wouldn't even be able to qualify. But at least there was the impetus there for billionaires and owners, team owners, maybe even GP2 teams to come in and say, actually, we want to make a Formula 1 team. There isn't even any impetus for people. I'm surprised Haas, as Gene Haas, has even come in and said, I actually want to join F1. There's, I don't, I really don't, it's just a losing venture. You're just going to lose money out of the whole scenario. Go and ask flipping Tony Fernandez about that. So, I don't know, it's, it's difficult. You're not, you're not getting enough teams involved. You're not getting enough good tracks being kept. All the good tracks are being lost. There's not enough entertainment value. There's more entertainment value in other series. That's that's the annoying factor. And I think the way that FOM run it and the way that it's run doesn't allow for the. I mean, the GPDA survey. It was good. It was a good idea at heart, but it was always going to be massively contradictory. Even though it was getting the fans involved, it was never going to be helpful realistically. So that's that's an issue. And uh, yeah, I just overall, the only thing that's actually going for Formula 1 at the minute is you've got so much talent, but then you haven't got enough teams to actually employ that talent. You've got drivers getting flung out left, right and centre at the age of 23 because they've had two decent seasons and suddenly they're out. Jean-Éric Verne is a prime example. There's just not enough seats in Formula 1 because there's not enough teams because there's not enough interest in the sport from other people. So, I haven't really solved anything, to be honest, I've just ranted quite spectacularly. But I just want to know what your thoughts are about this whole thing. Uh, drop them in the comment section below, all the topics that I've talked about, what your thoughts are on Formula 1 as a whole, in general, at this point in time. All the topics that I've talked about, leave your opinions in the comment section below, I would love to hear what they are. But nevertheless, it's been a pleasure, very spectacularly ranting at you guys today. If you did enjoy, like, uh, feel free to like, sorry, subscribe if you're new around here as well, and comment with your opinions on what I've talked about today. But it's been a pleasure ranting at you guys today, have a good day, enjoy yourselves, and goodbye.